Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. It's a great pleasure being here in this beautiful venue that I've played so many times. And uh, the first piece that I just played is called Nocturne. That was by Aram Kachaturian, an Armenian composer, and that's also my heritage. Um, and I, I presented a program here a few months ago in, in the fall where it was an all-Armenian program, so I decided to include a couple pieces in today's presentation. Uh, well, you see solo violinists uh, standing alone, so you probably expect some Johann Sebastian Bach, and I'm not going to disappoint you. Here is the uh, gavotte from the third violin partita. I'd like to talk briefly about this, um, this violin pieces, violin sonatas and partidas. There's a very interesting background to these pieces. Uh, some musicologists uh, might contest to what I'm going to say now, but I still, I'm still going to say that. I'm still going to tell you the story. I think it's worth telling at least. So, um, th these were written in 1720. Um, Bach was then it's kind of 35 years old. Um, he was out of town, there were, he was living in Cotton with, him, with his family and his, uh, his children and his wife Maria Barbara. He was out of town and uh, his wife fell ill and died within a matter of um, a few days. So when, when he got back, I think when, he, when Bach, when the composer returned back, she was already buried. So you can imagine what kind of a shock, what common tragedy that would have been for, for him. They had lived together a number of years, I think, like 12 years, and they had um, children together. They, they were happy as a family. So he comes just to find that his wife of many years has passed away. Um, for a while, uh, it looks like he wasn't really composing much in the court. This was the only time Bach was employed as, I think, it was the only time he was employed in a secular position, so not in a church, not in a cathedral, but as a, in the service uh, with the Prince of Kyoto. And so he was just carrying with his responsibilities. And then uh, the first uh, large project that he finished was the set of three violin sonatas and three violin partidas. Now, some uh, experts, some musicologists, uh, think that there was kind of a loose 
dedication of these pieces to his wife. But to be sure, there is an actual dedication is nowhere to be seen, but we know that in Bach's time, symbolica meant a lot in music. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of things like evil and the goods, and uh, you know, especially in, in a religious context, where um, the composers were trying to reveal that in some kind of symbolic ways. Uh, so the title piece, if I remember from memory, the title piece of these great works says, um, uh, well, it says that it's by solo violin pieces, uh, and then it says, um, well, I'm sure it says sei solo, sei solo, which will, I guess, translate as six solos in Italian, a, a violino for violin, senza basso accompagnato, without accompaniment. And then it says, you know, uh, I think Libra Prima, first book one and the year. One, it's strange that he writes the year there because it wasn't very common for him to write the Euro composition. But another interesting thing is a grammatical mistake that Bach makes, maybe, in, in the very first two words of the title page. Sei solo. Now, in Italian, sei means six. That lines up. There are six pieces, three, three partitas and three sonatas. But in Italian, if, if anything is plural, then, um, you know, then the ending of the word should, should uh, change. So solo should become a soli. You know, we don't say five solo, we say celli. You know, so it's like the E, the I in Italian is replacing the English pro S. So Bach is writing, say, solo. We can say it's making a grammatical mistake, but not knowing Italian, uh, I was able to decipher that this was something that's wrong there. And I'm assuming Bach knew Italian way better than I did. I did. Um, there is not a way of reading the first word, sei, which both in Italian and in German in different ways means um, I am, or uh, the imperative be. And solo basically means alone. So if you translate it that way, uh, suddenly first two words become I am alone, or be alone. And if we consider that this, this were written uh, very soon after his wife's death, it may be that the composer was just playing a word play there, saying, I am alone, rather than making a rather rudimentary grammatical mistake. At least I want to believe that the romantic part of the story. So uh, I'm going to start, uh, well, I'm going to play uh, a couple of more movements from these wonderful works. Here is the very first movement from the first sonata called Adagio.
thank you. Uh, one more piece from the cycle. This is a piece called Andante from his second violin sonata. I think I have it here. Uh, Bach wrote a lot of polyphonic writing uh, in, in violin playing. And, well, he was primarily an organist. Uh, and um, counterpoint polyphony was one thing that he thrived in. So he brought that into violin playing too. He was not the first to do it. There were a number of other composers before him. Um, uh, Heinrich Ignaz von Bieber wrote a piece called Passacaglia. And there are some um, opinions that Bach's Chacon might have been uh, inspired by that. So as, while he was not the first, he did definitely perfected the art of writing uh, for uh, right of, the art of polyphonic writing for violin. So what I'm going to play now is um, a piece called Andante from his second violin sonata where he makes it sound like there are two instruments playing at the same time, one playing a melody, the other one accompanying. I'll play a piece by Pietro Locatelli. He was a virtuoso violinist who lived uh, about a hundred years before Paganini. I think he actually died before Nicola Paganini was even born. And I mentioned Paganini's name because his name um, and his image is usually associated with the concept of virtuosity, violin technique, um, and everything really um, wonderful connected, you know, to the violin. Paganini's caprices are considered to be the pinnacle of violin writing, technically, in many ways, musically, too. But there were people who paved the way for him, and one of them was Pietro Locatelli. He was probably born, he, well, he was probably just as good as Paganini, except maybe was born in times when violin virtuosity was not as much of a thing. 
um, you know, he was, um, again, Paganini was born right and, and was performing right into you know, the beginning of the Romantic era, while Locatelli really belo uh, belonged to the Baroque. He composed Caprices, I think uh, Paganini got his idea of Capriccios from Locatelli, and one of them is called The Labyrinth. Don't be afraid. Uh, no Minotaur here. <laughs> the one, this is just a, a musical labyrinth, I think. Let me turn the violin. Let's see if I'll get out of that labyrinth. play uh, one more piece. I started this segment of the performance with an Armenian piece. I also end this segment with another Armenian piece. And then after that, I'm going to take a two or three minute break, quick, just to change a couple of things, a couple of requisites, and I'll be back. So uh, here's a piece that's going to breach the two main segments of the performance. There's classical, we're playing classical so far, or I should say Western art music, yeah, classical thing below. I went to school for music, and I should use the correct terminology. Uh, so, I'm going to play um, a piece that's really, it, it's a folk piece, but it's, it's been arranged for more classical performances, you know, there's an arrangement for violin and piano, there's an arrangement for a quartet with a folk instrument, um, I can probably count a dozen different arrangements of this piece. It's called Kurung, which in Armenian is the word for the crane. Crane have been, cranes um, have been very symbolic in, in the East, in the Orient, you know. Uh, not only in Armenia, but all the way through Far East, China, and Japan. A crane often symbolizes um, home, the nest, and um, longing for home. Um, and this song, originally, it, uh, it looks like it was a religious melody written probably in 12th century. Then 12 years, uh, it, it was very common in Armenia to take a religious song, change the words, and sing it in different contexts. 
in different um, places, you know, not only inside the church. Uh, this might have been some kind of a transformation too. So this is a, the, I don't want to say a lament, it's more like um, just a longing of a man who's outside of his country, uh, just like, I guess, three-fourths of Armenians are now, maybe, uh, and he's longing for his land, so he asks the crane, you're coming from east, have you seen my land, do you have a letter for me? Uh, and the crane doesn't. So I'm going to end this segment of the uh, performance of this piece, and hopefully it'll do a smooth transition to some folk violin. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a couple, a two or three minute break and I'll be back with uh, some more violin playing. Thank you.
Hello, welcome back. This is Henry Karapetian. Uh, it's again my great pleasure to be here uh, at Keo Town Concert House. Uh, before I start this segment of the performance, I want to thank everyone here um, for uh, organizing this performance, the administration, Keo Town Concert House. I want to thank you guys for tuning in uh, and donating board tickets. It helps sustain this wonderful uh, venue and it, of course, you know, helps the artists too. And, uh, you know, we're all itching to play, so this is, <laughs> it's also uh, really, you know, a pleasure to be, I guess, in sort of a concert, to have a concert experience. Um, so, I'm going to, uh, th this set of the, of the performance will be all folk music. I've been very fortunate to be in both classical and folk worlds. Um, although I started as a classical violinist, uh, I, I've been playing in different folk bands for about 10 years now. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with a set of some klezmer tunes. Klezmer is the Eastern European uh, Jewish music, mostly dancing tradition, actually. So there are four dances. The first one is called um, a gypsy hora. Now, when you think of a hora, you think of a very fast piece, but it'll depend on the context. Um, sometimes horas were slower pieces. Uh, after the wedding, hora would be a piece that the, the in-laws would be accompanied home with. So the musicians would accompany the in-laws home with a beautiful hora, and it could be, couldn't be too fast because people had had too much fun already. And they needed some, you know, this nice rhythm to work with. So after the, let me see, after the, yeah, after the Gypsy Hora, I have a Hosido that also danced, and it's one of the most fascinating dances. Um, Walter Zeff Feldman, one of the great uh, experts in klezmer music, has a very beautiful uh, talk on YouTube about, about uh, this dance, and also in his book about klezmer. And he says it's a, it's a solo man's dance, meaning there can be many men dancing on the stage, but each dances for himself. Um, it's kind of a meditative dance. So uh, I'll follow the Hora with, with a Hosodo, it's called Hosodo. And then two bulgars. Now, a bulgar is kind of the quintessential klezmer tune, I guess. Uh, also known as Freilachs, which means happy. Also known as Serba, which means Serbian. Uh, Scotchman. It's basically five or six words for the same thing. A fast paced tune with this groove. You know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So there will be two bulgars following that. So what do we have? We have a Gypsy Hora, Kosovo, and Kabul Girls.
some of the band's part too here. Um, let's see what I have next. Uh, oh, yeah, Danny Boy. You know, it's, it's often thought to be the most famous Irish tune, except it's not Irish. Uh, it was written by Frederick Weatherly in 19, early 1900s. Uh, he wrote the melody and the lyrics, and then he didn't like his own melody, so he supplemented, he chose, he kind of adjusted his words to this new melody of, a, of an English tune called Londonderry Air, and it's almost an insult the story I'm telling you now. But it's an English tune, uh, Londonderry Air, and Frederick Waterley never even visited Ireland. And if you ever thought, like I used to, that the pipes, the pipes that are calling Danny, are the pipes that are calling him to go to find the Brits. No, it's the pipes that are taking him to America. It's the steamboat. That's what the pipes are referenced to. So here's a solo violin version of Danny.
Thank you very much. Uh, well, now I'll play. I think we have enough time for me to play some more. Again, I have the great opportunities and fortunes in this beautiful city, uh, it's in this very musical environment, to play a variety of musical styles. Um, Celtic, country, Eastern European, Near Eastern. Um, you can check out some of the music that I play with uh, Dave Sharp World's Quartet. It's some of the tunes that we write ourselves. Some of them are coming from all over the world, you know, Armenian, Iranian, African, Bulgarian, uh, men from different cultures. It's like a kind of world music. I also play in a klezmophonic, the, the, the town klezmer band, I guess we can call ourselves. I can't present every single style here, but I'm going to go on. I think we have enough time for me to play um, a medley of some Celtic tunes, and then I'll play a medley. Oh, no, and then I'll play a tune called um, "Home in the Morning." It's a country tune. Improvise a little bit on that, and I'll end with one of my favorite tunes. I'll tell you which one it is when we get there. This is a. Uh, a compilation of a number of, I don't know what the number is, a number of uh, Celtic, that is, you know, uh, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh uh, melodies, ballads, and airs, and jigs, and, uh, and wheels. Start with a Scottish one called Cameron Highlanders.
authentic here. It would be silly for me to try to be authentic with all the styles. And this is why the program was called Modern Violinist, because I think, uh, in my opinion, you know, the, a modern violinist to be successful. Uh, and I'm talking about also, you know, a lot of classical violinists too. I think we have to be a little more flexible with the changing environment, changing tastes, without compromising the quality of the playing, quality of music. It's possible to play in any style really well. Um, so, in other words, I'm against musical elitism here. Um, but at the same time, it would be silly for me to try to play like uh, a real, you know, country fiddle player. I'll make a fool of myself. So instead, I'm uh, trying at least, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully more or less successfully trying to bring together uh, conventional violin technique with some interesting ideas from folk music and, and, and put it together. Uh, probably the best of all the worlds. So uh, here are the time with middle of improvisation.
Thank you very much. Uh, before we go to the last one, again, I want to thank everyone in the administration. Thank you, Monica, for uh, organizing this performance. Thanks, Dan, for helping everyone for being part of this. It was a great pleasure being here. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting this wonderful organization um, until we you know, come back to normal, yeah? uh, hopefully very soon. Uh, one of my absolutely favorite tunes, I know it, it's very, maybe it's a very cheesy tune, I don't know, I wasn't, I'm not from American culture, so sometimes I like something that people think is very cheesy, or <laughs> very, very, a little too popular here. Well, I do love this piece, it's an old Scottish tune called All Land Something, Old Land and I, I think, uh, and I think it's, kind of, it's a New Year's tune, I think, it doesn't matter, good music can be played any time. So, uh, the lyrics, by the way, are by Robert Burns. I'm not, not going to sing it, but uh, that makes it even more special. So I would like to conclude the performance with a solo violin version of, um, of this song.